Hi, guys. Can you hear me, Dee? Yep, we can hear oh, you. Hello. Okay, good. So hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be back today to talk more about being an effective supervisor of young adult therapeutic peer mentors. If you weren't with us last month, um, I think I have a unique perspective that I bring to this work because of my experience as a clinical supervisor of young adult peer mentors, but also because I'm a researcher and I've been talking to folks who have been implementing or researching um, near age young adult services for the better part of seeing like the last eight years. Um, it's a really unique position. Um, and we talked a lot last time about just how unique this role of a uh, uh, a young adult therapeutic peer mentor is, and today I really want to uh, focus on, you know, what is supervision? How do you teach self-care? How do we manage and help support strong working alliances that these young adults, um, young adult therapeutic peer mentors are developing with their clients? Just really quickly, because I want you to get an idea of, of what I do. I specifically, I'm a clinical social worker with a license and all of my work is specifically done. Any research I do is done to inform practice directly. Um, I really do see myself as a knowledge generator and translator and I do truly cherish opportunities like this where I get to take my own lived experience as a practitioner and integrate it with my ideas and research and of course my lessons learned. A lot of this is coming, especially some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, is really truly coming from things I learned through implementing young adult peer mentoring um, at Threshold uh, in Illinois. Um, and quickly, I have, I have a really bizarre position, maybe not so bizarre, but it feels bizarre to me, where I straddle both the academic and applied worlds. And so part of my work is with the UMass RTC that's led with Marianne Davis. And my work there is um, developing and implementing and evaluating young adult peer support best practices. And we implemented this program um, about a while back now. It was a three-year project where we had to develop uh, just like you guys are developing the practice profile and what young adult therapeutic peer mentoring looks like in Massachusetts, we had to think about what would this look like at thresholds in Illinois. And it, you know, it, it developed over time. And that's something I want you to be okay with and to trust this process that even if you get down on paper, this is exactly what supervision should look like um, for this role to supervise young adult therapeutic peer mentors. And this is exactly exactly what young adult therapeutic peer mentors are supposed to do, know that within your context that that is going to evolve and that's a good thing. You want this role to be something that is flexible and meets the true needs of the clients. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I also just, I want to quickly say that I have a, a paper out with John Delman. It's available on the RTC's website. I'm pulling some of the things I'm going to talk about today directly from that paper. Um, and so if you want to access that, it's all about from the perspective of young adult peer mentors and their supervisors, what makes a young adult therapeutic peer mentor, a young adult peer support worker successful on the job. And so that paper has some ideas that I'm going to bring up today and give you some examples of what that looks like. Also, please, please ask me questions, um, put questions in the box while we're going through this because I really hope that if I'm not answering things today, that when I come in the spring, that I'll be able to truly connect with y'all and make sure that I can give lived experience and real examples of some of the things I've learned with this. And finally, so this was a long time ago, it's a photo of um, myself um, and some young adult peer mentors in a program um, at Thresholds in Chicago. And I just, I always try to share a little bit of something about my life. I'm going to ask you in your practice as a supervisor of young adult therapeutic peer mentors to really dig deep within yourself when you're supervising, to be vulnerable and to reflect on your own development as a clinician, as a human, um, in the relationship that you have with your colleagues, with your uh, therapeutic peer mentors. I want you to reflect on your own stories of resilience. I can tell you that one of the most rewarding, I would say, clinical experiences of my life has been being a, a supervisor to young adult peer mentors. I learned so much through that three-year process of figuring out what it was that we really wanted these young people to do and then what actually happened. You know, I had designed a whole bunch of stuff that completely didn't work. 
and that I realized that supervising and being having good quality supervision is really, really important. And it wasn't something that like I dreamt up overnight. It was over time and every week taking notes and trying to figure out what is it that I'm doing. And of course, consulting with a lot of practitioners, a lot of folks in the peer world. It's just been a tremendous learning experience for me. And I think that picture was taken about 2012. So moving on. The purpose of this training series is a slide from last time is really to increase your competency and I would say confidence and your capacity to reflect on your own experience as a clinical supervisor in the implementation of this new young adult therapeutic peer mentor role. Really, I would love for y'all to learn from each other. A webinar, I think, is not the best way to truly um, make this position of your position as well as the role of these young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Um, so the way it's going to fly is if we start to talk with each other and learn from each other. Um, but I also want to say that this training series is not just based on only my lived experience. It's based on talking with y'all, um, with some of your leaders in the state, and some of you have been gracious enough to email back and forth with me and help me to understand your context more. I've also consulted heavily um, with different folks across the country who are doing a variety of different types of peer approaches with young adults. And finally, the goal of all of this is to create something that can live far beyond my involvement um, in doing trainings, but to have some kind of living document that has concrete exercises, things that you can do with your therapeutic peer mentors in supervision with them in a formal type of way. Um, and this is something I'm going to be developing. I have lots of ideas of it. And you're going to hear a lot of it today as well. And I hope that you leave here today. purpose of today's webinar is really is that you have some concrete things you can take. I got a lot of questions about that last time. You know, where can I get a supervision toolkit or where can I um, figure this out? What I'm going to introduce are a lot of principles, some key practices, and then I have a bunch of slides in here. And I hope that you've gotten the slides. If you haven't already, they should have been emailed out to you. A lot of links to free things that I just think are fantastic things I've drawn from. But again, I'm going to encourage you to really use what you think is Work, is going to work in your context. Here's what we covered last month. Um, if you're interested, if you haven't seen that webinar, um, these are some of the things. Today, though, we're really going to focus on your unique role. Um, also, we're going to talk about what psychological capital is. Seems like a fancy concept, but it's really a thing, and I think it's a helpful concept um, to think about when you're supervising young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Part of your role is going to be to really help develop psychological capital. Um, in young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Also, our number one thing I think that a lot of people get hung up on and concerned with and fearful of is boundary violations. Like, how do I help these young people really have healthy uh, boundaries and healthy relationships with their clients? And so we're going to talk about that, talk about self-care. We're also going to talk about strategic storytelling. I'm going to lay out some principles and give you some examples. I think in the spring, this is what I'm really going to focus on is, is the storytelling aspect of it and the balancing storytelling with motivational interviewing and how, how just a cool process that is. Um, but it's challenging, and, and your job is to help support that. Um, and also accommodations. I have to mention this. Um, this is in our toolkit that John Delman and I have developed um, that's going to be widely available soon. Um, on the RTC's website, but accommodations are just should just be part of regular practice with young adult therapeutic peer mentors and in practice for all staff. Um, that's just something that we just need to get out there. There should not be a stigma around it. And so I just want to introduce some accommodations that I find that are common um, with young adult therapeutic peer mentors across the country um, and also a way to think about them that might shift the stigma around them. And also I just have to throw in because in my in my world, as a researcher and program evaluator, I'm always thinking about continuous quality improvement. And so I just have one slide for you guys to think about as you're implementing this role now and as you're implementing as you are a supervisor and you're developing your supervision style with young adult therapeutic peer mentors, really reflecting on that and trying to improve the quality of it and the effectiveness of it and how you could do that. Okay. So this is something I think is so key, and I spent so much time in the last webinar being like, this role that young adults are in as therapeutic peer mentors is so unique. Well, the supervisor role, I think, is really unique, too. And I think there's a bunch of components to it that I just want to orient you to so that you're attuned to these components and that you know that, like, you know, when you're in your supervision with your supervisor, that you're talking about these and how you're doing in these 
these roles, and there are multiple roles as a supervisor, therapeutic peer mentors. So the first is um, that your job is really to be a facilitator and supporter of young adult therapeutic peer mentors in developing strong working alliances with their clients. We're going to talk about strong working alliances again. I know I mentioned it last time, but I, I want to develop it. I want to re, um, return to that because I want to get away from the word relationship. I know I'm talking really quickly. I get, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get through everything today. But I, one thing I really want you to take from this is that we all are so afraid of relational boundaries. And we think about, like, how do we manage them and monitor them? And I want you to take a step away from that language and think about the idea of the working alliance and how just introducing that language and, and examining working alliances. So gonna, I have a lot of ways to do this I'm going to introduce. But just getting away that, from this the notion of a relationship and the intimacy that that word invokes and just thinking about how if we just say, how is your alliance? We ask our young adult therapeutic peer mentors, how is your alliance with this client? And we're going to talk about what the alliance is made up of. But I think it, it takes away some of the stigma and some of the fears. It's just an idea of mine, and I, I think it could be very helpful. Also, you are, by default, a champion and advocate for young adult therapeutic peer mentors. I talked about this at the end of the webinar. I have a couple of um, last time, and I have a couple of nods to it this time. But you truly are. Um, in order for this young person and young people to be successful in this role, you're going to have to address some system stuff. You're going to have to be a champion. You're also a role model and coach, which we definitely covered last time. I just wanted to give a nod to this idea of coaching, that you are always going to be thinking about how you can introduce small ideas and trainings to your young adult therapeutic peer mentors, that you always have to think about developing them and coaching them. It's not that they just go out to an outside training and they figure it all out and come back to you all trained up. And this, I would argue, is how you should think about all staff, always. How I think about all the folks that I supervise. We're always thinking about development. Also, you, and this is, I would say also for all employees as well, remaining aware and conscious of the well-being of any employee. But uniquely, as we talked about last webinar, young adults who are in the transition to adulthood are facing a whole lot of stuff really unique compared to any other phase in development. And also this role of therapeutic peer mentor has a lot of unique challenges. And you need to just keep those in mind with, and be attuned to the well-being of these young adult therapeutic peer mentors on the job. Okay. So with this working alliance, just simply to reiterate that the working alliance is something um, that is a, a, a a collaboration that a uh, therapeutic peer mentor engages in with their client where together they develop a bond where they share goal formation and they work on determining tasks that make sense. Well, guess what? You're going to do that with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Your goal in your work with them is you need to develop a strong working alliance with them. You're going to model this through doing it, through when you meet when you first hire young adult therapeutic peer mentors, or even if you already have them in place, meet with them and talk with them about what is our alliance like? How do we work together? What are some of the goals that we can work together on around your development, around your clinical capacity, your skills? Um, and what are some of the tasks that we can concretely do to do that? And you start doing that. You might say, oh, that feels like therapy. I would argue it, it's key to have a good working alliance with anyone on your staff. Make your struggle, make your team stronger. You also need to be thoughtful about teaching your young adult therapeutic peer mentors about what this work and alliance is, how in part it is a relationship. It's a bond. A bond has an emotional component to it. That matters. That goals matter. You have to be working towards some kind of shared goal. You know, you have a purpose. And that also that there has to be some concrete tasks. All day long, you can't just be talking about goals. You need to have things that are concrete, that are able, you're able to do together. You also I would argue, have to be thinking about the quality of the working alliance. These are going to change over time. Your young adult therapeutic peer mentors are going to have a variety of working alliances with their various clients, and they're going to change over time. And your job as a, as a supervisor is to help them examine these working alliances, which we're going to do through a process called reflective supervision. Um, I'm going to introduce some of those concepts in, in a little bit, but I know that um, the state has also been looking into that or is already maybe training on some reflective supervision, which I think is really fantastic. And also, 
that just really that this is about relationships. Reflective supervision is all about relationships, in fact, about systems and relationships and how we interact and communicate with one another and what those mean to us, what relationships mean, what communications mean. But that you're constantly, as a supervisor, going to be thinking about how do you help this young adult therapeutic peer mentoring navigate their professional relationships on the job, their relationships with clients. But then you also have to reflect on yourself and the relationship that you have with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. What's the quality of those? Could you improve upon those? Are you truly create co-creating goals? Are you co-creating tasks? Or, in my own experience, I was super directive for <laughs> a variety of reasons. I would sometimes tell them, you know, and sometimes you do, you have to be directive sometimes, but you really should try to always be partnering um, and, and not let it be that you're controlling what your young adult therapeutic peer mentors are allowed to do all of the time. There needs to be flexibility. They need to flex that peer, that lived experience that they have, and you need to be okay with allowing that. Okay, we move on. Oh, and normalizing. This is something I'm going to come back to, but just that in any relationship that one has with anyone in their system, their social network, that there's challenges at times, and that it's completely normal for young adult therapeutic peer mentors to experience challenges with their clients, and especially challenges with their coworkers, that that is going to happen. You should expect it to happen. You should tell the young adult therapeutic peer mentors that I expect there to be struggles. I expect it to not always be going well. And I want you to come to me, and we're going to talk about that. But that's what supervision is, because guess what? Not all young adult therapeutic peer mentors will get that and will understand that. Okay. You're also a champion and advocate. These are things that I really talked about last webinar, but I just wanted to give a nod to them as well, that you really have to think about clarifying this young adult therapeutic peer mentor role, always being really as clear as possible what it is that we're expecting these young people to do versus what we're not expecting them to do. Um, and especially I want to just highlight the fourth point is that in doing this work, we, we tend to you know, be really focused on the client. We're focused on, you know, how's the client doing and what's going on with them. And I, I don't want you to just be focused on, oh, the therape therapeutic peer mentor and their well-being, and I need to be really focused on how to make sure they're resilient on the job. But really take a look, take a step back and look at the systems that you're working within. Look at your context and, and how stigma and exclusion and misunderstanding on the job, because these are all things that your young adult therapeutic peer mentors are going to experience most likely not from their client interactions, but from their interactions with colleagues. They're going to experience some things, and you need to be there to talk these things through and to help them examine why these things are happening. It's not about the young adult therapeutic peer mentor being a certain way, a certain characteristic they have. It's that there's something there that's reinforcing the old view of what a young adult is in this professional work world or what a peer is. We need to start talking about those things and bringing those out into the open. And again, I did last are with this big shout out to use your own supervisor. Your supervisor is an adult therapeutic peer mentors. You've got to find someone that you can process this experience with. If it isn't your direct supervisor, get supervision from a supervision group or a family partner or a trusted call or your own therapist. Like go and get an opportunity to process some of this stuff. This is in my own experience is the only way that I could really make some of really quick complex things that pop in seeing a supervisor and the things that you see when you start to recognize injustice within your own context and you see colleagues of yours saying things in a way or excluding peers these young adult peers from the conversation you know you've got to really process that from someone that can get you really angry and you've got to process it so I just want to just once again just reiterate please figure out ways to continue processing that with people that you trust okay also all right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about relational boundaries. Um, it's probably my favorite topic. Um, and one way that I think is, is helpful to think about relational boundaries, you've got this relationship that you have, this bond, this working alliance, you as a clinical super have with your young adult therapeutic mentor, and then you have this young adult therapeutic mentor who has these relationships with their and that this thing, this big system thing that's happening, it's a parallel process. And that 
as you continue to demonstrate healthy relational boundaries in your own working alliance with your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, that then in fact, that young adult therapeutic peer mentors can practice healthy boundaries and healthy working alliances with their clients. So quickly, I just, I have to mention these things and I think they're so important um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so peer support is all about the relationship. It's, it's, it, the crux is that the relationship matters, that it's supposed to produce something that the professional a lot working alliance, the professional relationship isn't isn't able to. And so, you know, to an extent, we have to really think about what is it that makes up that bond that's part of a working alliance? What are the relational processes? So there's a fair bit of researchers out there, specifically Spencer, 2006, um, looking at, you know, what is it that makes up mentoring? There's collaboration, there's companionship, there's empathy, there's authenticity, and there's trust. And there's these things that are operating. And one thing that you can do in your supervision when you're meeting one-on-one -on -one or in a group, you can, you can help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to examine these elements of their working alliances with their clients. You can ask, so to what extent are you truly collaborating? Or perhaps, how are you not collaborating? Where is there trust and where is there not trust in your relationships with your clients? Perhaps just focus on one case. Maybe you say, let's just look at one, one working alliance. Let's really pick this apart and try to understand where is there authenticity? When is it authentic? When do you feel authentic? When do you not? When do you feel like the client is able to be authentic with you and when not? And I think that this is part of supervision that is just so important. I think it's important in all clinical supervision, but I think specifically with young adult therapeutic, excuse me, therapeutic peer mentors, that you have to examine these things because if you become overly authentic, authentic or maybe too trusting or, or it, it, right, if the therapeutic peer mentor does or the client does, it, gets, it, it could be toxic for the working alliance. So just really thinking about this. And then, because I love parallel processes, you've got to reflect on your own work with your therapeutic peer mentors. What's your trust? Do you trust them? Do you not? Are, are you able to empathize with what this young person is saying or, or not? And why? Right? That's supervision. Those questions. And that's what you bring. And that's what you examine. And in doing that in supervision, you're going to help young adult therapeutic peer mentors to bring up these sorts of things with their clients. They're going to think, how are we collaborating? What are we collaborating on? How, how am I really showing empathy? Am I? Am I not? What is this? Are we trusting each other? And if we're not, let's figure out how we can. If it's through trust, I'm actually going to be able to help you reach your goals and help you actually partner in determining tasks that we can do concretely to, re to reach goals. So just like to bring these things up. I don't have a formal checklist of what you should do. I'm going to start thinking a lot about this. These are things that I definitely talked about and processed with my young adult peer mentors but things that it's taken me a few years to reflect on my own practice to really bring these things up. I hope they're helpful to you. Also, and I mentioned this last time, but mutuality is where it's at. If you truly want to do peer support and you want to, you want to have young adult therapeutic peer mentors do good peer support, we have to allow our young adult therapeutic peer mentors to feel some benefit from this process. It's about providing support and receiving support. That's what is supposed to be different. And I wanted to read this quote. I found this a while back, and I just, I really liked this, and I think it, it sums up what I, like, will try to ramble on and say in a way that's succinct and I think helpful. So let me say it. It's from Maine. With intentional peer support, we share our stories in ways that help others consider how their beliefs and assumptions have created their reality, their understanding, choices, and even their relationships. And although we may have had some similar experiences, we listen for how people have learned to tell a particular story. And we ask questions that create space for reflection and awareness. We explain that we are not there as a peer provider to provide just help, but rather to contribute to a conversation and a process where we actively challenge each other and where recovery becomes a mutual dynamic relational process and outcome. This isn't just about therapeutic peer mentors being a service provider. It's about them engaging in an ongoing, continuously developing bond that's a movement in reality to truly have healing on multiple levels occur. So I want you to step out of 
it's just about the young adult therapeutic care mentor being a support provider, support service deliverer, and to recognize that the young adult therapeutic care mentor should be experiencing some benefit of this. Of course, we expect the client to. But we also want to open this up to the client being able to give as well, because that is also part of healing and is important. Okay, so here's where I shift here. How am I doing on time? I'm okay. To really what reflective supervision is and how you can integrate this. I'm going to get into what I mean by reflective supervision shortly. But that in fact, to be a successful young adult uh, therapeutic care mentor supervisor, you need to truly be collaborating with your therapeutic care mentors. You have to build a respectful, mutual relationship where you are not only directing what the young adult therapeutic peer mentor does, but you're learning from them, that it's non-hierarchical, that you're really trying to, to flush the power out, and this is truly impossible to do, but be, let me rephrase this, to be aware of the power dynamics that exist between you as a supervisor and your therapeutic peer mentors, and to really step back and be like, okay, we're both going to learn from each other. This is going to be, um, because we know there are no exact, evidence-based practices for how to best engage transition age youth um, diagnosed with serious mental health conditions or best practices to improve outcomes in this specific population. But together, we are going to work together to help a young person reach the goals that you guys work on collaborating together. And that we have to, in order for a young adult therapeutic mentor to be able to do that, we've got to have a really strong working alliance. One thing that I just have to emphasize, that I know I emphasized last time, but regular supervision has to happen. Don't cancel it because of crisis. Don't cancel it because you believe your young adult therapeutic peer mentors are thriving. Reflective supervision is based on the principle that supervision is happening all of the time. You need to carve out a regular time for you to reflectively, like, re, sorry, sorry, for you to reflect on your own work as a clinician and as a supervisor, but you sure have to make sure that you are providing a safe space where your young adult therapeutic mentors can come to you and you could talk through what their working alliances look like with all of their clients. Now, when I say reflection, it's really reflecting on the communication, relationships, observations, interactions, the emotionality of these interactions that young adult therapeutic mentors are having with their clients that you really need to help folks get this, that this is, we have to reflect on what it means to be having these interactions, what it means to go meet up in the community with your clients and role model, you know, how to fill out an application or to talk about what a traumatizing thing that you've overcome, that all of this has meaning and it has an emotionality to it and that we have to process that. Um, and in order to do this, we have to always be thinking about what we're learning about ourselves. Reflection is all about gaining self-awareness. We reflect in order to do, do that. We reflect in all, also in order to understand where other people are coming from, right? We reflect in order to gain insight, to be able to truly be empathetic. Um, and, 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 and doing reflection is how we become stronger clinicians, and it's how we're going to help our young adult therapeutic peer mentors understand what they're doing, right? That they're not just going out there and just helping but that they have to reflect on what am I doing and why am I doing it and what's working, what's not working, and why. Always ask why, 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 and then how could I shift my approach? How could I change my how I'm thinking about this or how I'm reacting? So incredibly important. At the bottom, I have a bunch of references I'm going to give you on reflective supervision guides. There's this really great one. Um, that's very readable from Illinois' Children Mental Health Partnership Reflective Practice Guide. I find this to be really, really helpful, but there's a bunch, I have a bunch of stuff at the end of this webinar and, and coming up about um, uh, more reflective supervision practices. Um, also, I just have to bring this up is that, and I struggled with the language with this, because we always talk about relational boundaries, but maybe the word is limits, or maybe we think about bracketing mutuality, that there, there's a limit to how mutual we can get. Um, I think, and I'd mentioned this a little bit earlier as well, is, is that we tend to always really think like we want to draw a, a, a strong or a very clear picture of who is the helper and who is the service recipient. I want to really push against that. Um, we want to remind our young adult therapeutic peer mentors in our supervision practice that, you know, sometimes it, it, it's 
you might not feel like you're getting through to your young adult clients, and they might not feel like you're getting through, and then we need to talk through that. This is where it becomes helpful to have multiple young adult therapeutic mentors on staff. I know that's not always the case, but sometimes in the matching process that mutuality just doesn't thrive, um, and you have to figure that out. Um, I mentioned this last time is about these, these limits on mutuality and this idea of having really clear agency policies. Um, for instance, you know, no physical fighting, no having sexual, having um, any kind of, uh, well, the thing is, let me back up with this, is that it's, it's also to have normalizing on here. I will be talking about normalizing in just a little bit. So this idea that we want to normalize when young adults feel uh, a romantic or a sexual attraction to one of their clients, that's normal, totally normal. We want to bring it up. We want to process it in supervision. That's where you bring it. Don't feel ashamed for being attracted to someone. Don't feel ashamed for feeling angry at a client. Don't feel ashamed for having any emotion in reaction to a client. That's all about what reflection is, is that you really want to examine how you are feeling uh, in relation to your clients and what the working alliance is producing in you and triggering in you. That is just so, so, so important. But also, as I went um, through in the last webinar, having some hard and fast rules around, you know, how we determine what boundaries look like. And I have some, I have an example coming up I think will be helpful. Um, also, I just wanted to quickly mention that sometimes you might have to jump in and help manage a situation that um, gets out of hand when you, for whatever reason, haven't developed a strong working alliance with your therapeutic peer mentor, and you start to notice some unhealthy things. You, your gut tells you your red flags start going up something's not right about this. The way that you're hearing about it from your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, or you're hearing about it from your colleagues, or you're hearing it from clients, there's something going on there. And it's up to you then to, to be transparent about, hey, I'm concerned about this, and here's why. And bringing it up directly with your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, and then talking through, is there too much empathy here? Is, is, are we over-trusting? Are, over, are we worrying too much about this young person? Are we over-involved? What's happening? Is the client expecting more than they should be in processing that, right? Use your best clinical judgment there and start to process the relationship stuff. And of course, I have to just bring up technology because it'd be a disservice to you if I didn't, is the importance of coming up with this best practice around social media, emailing, texting, especially texting, I might argue. I think texting is um, the most used and least talked about practice. Um, huge engagement tool. I don't know a, a young adult uh, uh, agency or agency that aims to serve young adults that isn't texting. But talking about the texting practices, not just the content of it, but when it's happening and where it's happening. And, and that, that you just have to be attuned to that in this role if you're working specifically with young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Um, okay. so. This idea coming back to maintaining, and I have these in quotes, this healthy, relational, boundaries, all these things are completely, I would argue, contextually based. And so this is going to be, again, a process of discussing what these things are. I don't want to tell you, this is what a healthy boundary looks like, and that's all that you got to do, that's what you got to look for, and when it becomes unhealthy, no, like, no. You have to process this. And I think it's helpful to talk through what's healthy, what is a relationship, what are boundaries, have these conversations with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. This is where you get to bring your clinical experience in and really discuss these and discuss what a working alliance is. Here's something um, that I came across that I think is actually a super helpful tool um, in exploring boundaries and relationships. And this idea of this would be a great way to start a dialogue with a multiple young adult therapeutic peer mentors. I think this is a group exercise is a fantastic bringing up behaviors, adding to this list at your contacts as things come up. My goodness, like all the different things that had come up, many of these reflected in this list, but not all of them, um, with young adult therapeutic peer mentors and the types of interactions they have and the things they, they experience. And when are some of these behaviors okay? And when are some of them never okay? And when are some of them context specific or contingent on a certain situation occurring? When might they be okay and why? And let's just keep talking about these. But this, I would argue, bringing up this stuff regularly, every month, if you have a way to have structured, I don't want to call it training, you could maybe call it coaching around or orienting to the things that matter in our work, or you could call it training if you want to, but I think really just having an in-depth discussion where you're not just, maybe I'm going to call it facilitating, you're facilitating a discussion where young adult therapeutic mentors can talk 
about these things. Okay. Oh, and here's the, uh, that's the website for that if you wanted to pick up this exact form. Okay. So quickly, I also wanted to talk about confidentiality um, and just how complex this is with young adult therapeutic care mentors. And I think this, of course, is connected to relationship boundaries, right? Like what can we share? What can we not share? This is going to vary in your context as well. Um, depending on your orientation and your clinical practice, um, I think, of course, HIPAA, you know, you have to, when you're bringing folks on, orienting them to HIPAA, orienting young adult therapeutic care mentors, and revisiting HIPAA standards regularly, um, I would say at least on a quarter, you know, reviewing them as a group if you can. One thing I just have to say, and I might have mentioned this last time, but this is so, so important, is really training and um, also reiterating that no secrets are allowed between therapeutic care mentors and clients. I think this is really the role of the supervisor to keep this notion alive. If you can, when you are introducing your young adult therapeutic care mentors to the clients, just kind of saying, hey, there's no secrets allowed in your work together. Like, I am always going to be part of this work. We are always working together. We're part of this to help you meet your, or your goals that you guys come up with. But there's no secrets allowed. And secrets come, came up a lot in my work. A lot of times young people would say, oh, don't tell so-and-so that. And it just brings up a whole bunch of stuff. So being really clear from the beginning and always reiterating this. And then I think this is like the most interesting and also um, maybe one of the most important things for you to really, really drive home with young adult therapeutic care mentors and regularly discuss this is that what young adult therapeutic, therapeutic care mentors choose to share with their clients is their choice. Clients are not bound to HIPAA confidentiality rules. Clients can share a young adult therapeutic peer mentor's lived experience with their peers, with their family, with whoever. And I think if you work in an agency where you have the young adult clients interacting a lot, that this could become really interesting really quickly. And so you want to just really um, orient and attune your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to what they're sharing could become public knowledge. And so to be thoughtful about that, um, just really, I, this came up over and over about um, young adult therapeutic care mentors feeling burned, feeling uh, disrespected by their clients because they shared, you know, some things that they thought were between them and were private. And so just really reiterating this, and then when it comes up, saying, you know, we've got to really remember this, that you know, this isn't, um, that it's not going to be something private. They're not held to HIPAA like you are. Okay. I want to quickly mention outreach, um, and I do think this is, is super important and you might be like, why are you talking about outreach as a supervisor, you know, is an outreach something that like a practitioner is going to go do with clients? I think that you need to, also, like before even outreach is a thing, you need to be thinking about small wins. Um, I think I mentioned this last webinar, but I'm going to mention it again. It's really, really important to focus on small um, successes. And you might say, oh, I know that. I totally do that with my clients. It's really, really, really important, I think, with young adult therapeutic care mentors who are um, at high risk for burnout um, because I think many of the young people I've worked with came into this role really thinking they were going to change the world. They were going to share their story and they were going to make a really big difference. And when they start to not see the kind of impact that they are hoping to achieve, it can be frustrating. And so what you've got to do is start really figuring out a way with partnering with your young adult therapeutic care mentors to identify things that make them feel like, hey, this feels good. I feel like I'm making progress when I get this kind of uh, reinforcement or this kind of feedback. That's you getting to know your therapeutic peer mentors. Oh, excuse me. Um, also, um, that you have to really be thinking about when a young adult therapeutic peer mentor starts to change. If their behavior changes drastically or your clinical gut, I'm going to say this, you start to be like, hey, wait a minute. This young person is, is acting different. Their attitude's different. Their performance at work is something different that you are transparent and you bring it up with them out of, you have a strong working alliance with this therapeutic. You care about their well-being and you want to understand how they're doing and what's going on. And maybe nothing's going on, but if you're able to get this young person talking about it, you could prevent, um, a, a, I don't want to say a spiral into burnout, um, and, but you can. You really have to be aware of this and that you might, as a supervisor, need to do some outreach at times. This is something that I've talked to a lot of people across the country about, that young people feel ashamed um, if, if 
they feel that they've failed in some way, a client, or they made a mistake on the job, and a lot of these young people in these roles, this might be their first professional gig. And it's up to us if, if, they, if they start to maybe disappear, show up late from work, that we start to inquire, not assume, oh, they're lazy, they're not doing their job, they're trying to get away with something, that no, there's something going on. And I need to do a little outreach as a supervisor um, so that these young people um, in this unique role as a therapeutic peer mentor are not taking their inability or what they're, they're not interpreting um, their client not making more progress as their own fault. They seem to be really aware of that. Okay. So here's where I'm going to get to this concept of psychological capital. And I know I mentioned it earlier, but it's this idea that it's a psychological state um, that's characterized by self-efficacy, optimism, perseverance, hopefulness, and resilience. And guess what? This is all things that anyone should have on the job. In order to be an effective practitioner, you kind of have these things. You have to remain optimistic. And how many of you are probably like, yeah, right, like, it can be hard. We have hard work. We live in an interesting society. But this idea of psychological capital is that it's something that can be nurtured. It's not that people are just resilient as a characteristic, which I'm going to get to, I think, on the next slide, but it's that we can really develop this. And someone with a serious mental health condition or a severe physical condition can also have these things, that we can help them develop these things. And part of your job as a supervisor is to help foster these things in your young adult therapeutic peer mentors, that you're thinking about how optimistic are they, how are they persevering on the job, how hopeful they are, are they, and how resilient. I'm going to get to resiliency in just a second, too. I mentioned this last webinar, um, but there's these parts of supervision that are really important. And there's, it's not just about that you have to help instill some clinical skills, that you need to be thinking about wellness. You have to be thinking about performance. You have to be thinking about skill development in relationships. Of course, I talked a lot about the notion of the working alliance and that that matters. And, of course, career development. I have another slide on that coming up. But self-care. I cannot emphasize enough that your role as a supervisor is to really practice self-care, but also to help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to practice self-care. And then another parallel process is that then your young adult therapeutic peer mentors can help their clients practice self-care. But all this matters. And because self-care, if you can really be resilient, on, or excuse me, if you can really take care of yourself, then you can be resilient on the job. So quickly, and this is my, my thing as a, as a social worker and a professor, and when I teach social workers about this stuff, I always get on my high horse that self-care is often misinterpreted. It's often just like a quick fix. Um, and I think this is because we tend to think of resiliency as this bouncing back idea, which many people will say, well, yeah, like it's your capacity to overcome adversity. And I get that. But self-care isn't about escaping, you know, an unjust situation or escaping trauma. It's truly a pattern of adaptation. So I want you to really put your developmental hat on and be thinking about resiliency is something that is a process that occurs over time, that you're not just helping your adult therapeutic peer mentors, like, come up with things that they can help deal with a um, potentially traumatizing event at work. No, you're helping them to develop a pattern of wellness that they're able to sustain over time to enable to do the work they're doing, arguably with some of the highest risk clients that we have. We know adolescent and young adults are full of risk-taking behavior. And so we really, really want our young adult therapeutic peer mentors to stay healthy. And we need to think about resiliency as a pattern of behavior, a pattern of, of wellness. It's not necessarily a trait that someone has. Yeah. Okay. So, it's a process, and here's a, a nice quote, self-care is possessing an self-awareness to invoke repeated patterns of being that harmoniously correct the behaviors of over-functioning for others while under-functioning for yourself. I like this little process. Um, I'm not going to get into detail about this um, just because of the amount of time I have, and I really want to get to strategic storytelling, but just this idea that is part of the self-care process that you're going to help young adult therapeutic peer mentors engage in, you have to help them explore how to take care of themselves. How do you create this pattern of wellness? You then have to activate it. I think this is one of the most challenging things. We see this a lot with our clients, too. Like, how do you get someone to start a new behavior change? Like, we often think about it a lot and plan it a lot and then think about the barriers to it a lot, which are very important. But we also just have to start doing it and then start reflecting on what it's like to do this. Like, what on earth am I doing and is it benefiting me or not? 
Um, and as we're engaging in this behavior, this change, and this, this new practice, how are we connecting with others and sharing our experiences? Again, supervision should serve as this opportunity to be like, I am taking care of myself in this new way. I'm eating differently. I'm doing exercise. And those are very, um, I don't want to say superficial, but they're typically the things people jump to when they think self-care. They think, I'm going to get more sleep. I'm going to eat better. Um, but it's, it's those types of things you need to share with people. That's why social media is so powerful, um, because you can feel very empowered from connecting with others as you engage in your self-care practices. And then always, and I know because I'm a researcher and a program evaluator, evaluation is part of this. You have to always be like, what am I doing? How is this practice benefiting me? Because guess what? If it's not benefiting you anymore, you need to be switching up your practices. So quickly, just in my own practice and in training a lot of people and, and helping folks to really be attuned to self-care, things that get in the way of self-care are usually um, the problem. You can plan the perfect self-care plan all day long. We all do it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I say to myself, I'm going to journal and reflect and I'm going to do this and then something gets in the way. It's really addressing what gets in the way is how you're going to uh, instill behavior change. It's also a multi-level approach. Here's where I'm going to tell you again. This is not just about you supporting your, your young adult therapeutic peer mentors in being attuned to self-care and taking care of themselves. You've got to do it yourself. This is my shout out to you to take a step back and to think about this process and to think about your own patterns of taking care of yourself and how you can role model those patterns for these young people. And also, I hate that it's called self-care. It's so stupid. Because really, it's, it's not just an individual is held responsible for their own self-care. I would argue that an agency, maybe society, but I'm just going to say an agency or maybe a team level, a team should be aware of everyone's well-being on the team and that we should reinforce our, 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 each of us, we should, we should be attuned and aware that we should be practicing self-care, that we should reinforce each other's practice of self-care, and that it isn't just an individual effort. Folks shouldn't just be coming up with this on their own. That's what I'm telling you. In order for young adult therapeutic peer mentors to be successful, part of my work was bringing in, okay, what are we doing to take care of ourselves? And bringing in tools, what I'm going to get to in a minute. So I've got some tools that I think will be helpful. So this is just quickly a shout out about psychological capital and how self-care can boost psychological capital. My whole point of talking about this self-care piece is that Young people can maintain their wellness and their, their positive attitude towards the work that they're doing and maintain healthy working alliances with their young adult clients who have all different types of things going on um, through self-care. Um, I think, and I, I'm sure I've mentioned this, and if you know me, I talk about this a lot, is that it's really, really, really tough to be in the role of young adult therapeutic peer mentor because it's not just about telling your story, it's about being a role model. And in part in being a role model is you have to help these young people take care of themselves and teach them about self-care. So help your therapeutic peer mentors to recognize everyone has off days, everyone has personally stressful days, that's why we have personal days off. Encourage young people to, to reflect on how they're doing. Take walks during the day. That's often one of the um, best uh, self-care practices that we practice in my department is and you really just need to take a break from things. Take a break and go reflect. Go breathe in the air. Focus on the trees. Focus on now we have snow on the ground here in Chicago. Like thinking about like what just getting your mind off of something and breathing in something else um, to reset yourself, if you will. Um, also, that you have to have an individualized self-care plan and you need to review that plan and the progress on that plan. And supervision is a great way to do that. It's a great opportunity. Here's my shout out to you that you have to practice this. And I've already said this, you have to really, really, really encourage young people who are going to be wanting to do a good job for you. You've got to encourage them to take their time off, okay? You need to take your time off too, right? Hear this, take your time off, okay? Um, oh, and if they're, oh, this is so important. This is why we don't really have a private space here at our agency, at least in this building I'm in. We're taking a moment, unless you're lucky enough and have uh, an office if you're high enough on the totem pole. Um, which I am not. And so for me, this taking a walk is something that definitely is, has become a practice. But if there is a space, like a private space, for people to decompress, to laugh, to enjoy a meal, very, very, very important to have. Space is a big deal. So here's my little refrigerator list. Um, this is what you do when you're first trying to get um, your young adult therapeutic preventers to think about, you know, what are things they do 
to maintain their wellness and well-being? What feeds their soul? Like, what is it? And then what are all these little things you could do? And this is what we call a refrigerator list. It's kind of like a dated idea, but I'm bringing it up because it's typically what is brought up um, in the social work world is this list of things. You could put it on your refrigerator and you could just go to it in a moment of stress that you're feeling overwhelmed. And again, I know that's not exactly what I was just talking about. I want to have a self care plan in place where you're practicing wellness. But this is the idea to get things started. Starting to think about what could I do to improve my wellness? And of course, self care, and this is, I'm not going to get really heavy into this, but that, of course, it's not just about eating and sleeping, it's about spiritual well being and, and interactional well being. It's about who you, who you feel that you are within your relationships. It's about what surrounds you. Um, do you have plants in your office? Do you have nice lighting? Are you allowed to listen to your headphones, listen to music? Like all this kind of stuff we do, small things we can do to take care of ourselves on the job, I think get underestimated. And these are things you can bring up and talk about and put a plan in place for. Um, I like this example of self-care. You can bring this up in your supervision regularly, I would say at least once a month. Um, reviewing these, or maybe you have part of it every week. We, we review, you know, how are your self-care practices going? Um, here are some really, really helpful self-care plan examples that you could, these are all different things that I've reviewed over the last few years that I think are really easy to implement and will be helpful to you. Um, and this slide, I think what I really wanted to say is that, you know, this is all, relationships are all about emotions. Um, it's the truth. And that you're, you're really there as a supervisor to help make sense of all of this, right? And to be there to be a sounding board. And you have to have a strong working alliance with your young adult therapeutic mentors to do that, you've also got to share your own stuff. As I started this out, I said, you, I really want you to be vulnerable. You're going to feel like you're being really vulnerable, but we're expecting these young adult therapeutic mentors to do that. So share your personal story. Practice sharing your story. It's a lot of fun, actually. You're going to learn a lot as a clinician and doing. Also, there's this, I have this in bold, healthy versus unhealthy venting. I think we all know what can happen sometimes, especially um, if this hasn't happened already. It, it will. Colleagues can say some interesting things about young adult therapeutic peer mentors, and you need to figure out a way to process that with them and how to be transparent about what that is and what that is reinforcing about stigma within your own agency and organization. Just identifying what is venting versus processing something, right? And venting might have to happen. We, get, we can get angry. That's part of the emotion that might be experienced. But that, that when it becomes all about anger and all about venting, we kind of have to step back and, and address system problems, right? It's not just your job to ensure the well-being of young adult therapeutic peer mentors. It's the agency's job to ensure the well-being of all of the staff. However, you have this weird, unique champion advocate role that you just have to be aware of all the time. You might have to have some conversations with your supervisor and your supervisor's supervisor, or maybe some people high up about, hey, we have got some really wonky policies we've got to like readdress around the well-being of not just myself, but also my staff. And finally, I just have to put a shout out there for the value of therapy, the normalizing of therapy. Encourage your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to have a therapist. Every single young person that we hired had a therapist. Um, who was in the role of therapeutic peer mentor and talked about, you know, the, the value of therapy. We want the young people in this role to value therapy. We don't want you as a supervisor to be a therapist. We'd love for you to say, oh my gosh, when I was working with a therapist, I realized all these things about myself. Normalizing that therapy is a good thing for professionals to have. It's something that I think we just need to do. Here's some really helpful free young adult therapeutic supervision resources. I found these to be really, really easy to implement. After the last um, webinar, people were really like clamoring for some more concrete stuff. And what I'm giving you is really more of like an overview of principles, some small practices you can do. But I'm trying to reorient you to how you think about supervision. Here's some things where you can go in where there's some worksheets and some um, things to bring up um, in, in discussions um, that could be really concrete and helpful. So I, I and a self-care plan. I think when I keep saying self-care plan, that might seem very vague. Here's some concrete examples of what that might look like for young people. And getting anything written down, I think it's really helpful. It might seem silly, like, oh, I'm filling out paperwork. But having that to come back to a month later and say, oh, wow, you said, you know, that you were really going to start journaling and that you were going to 
you know, eat different food in the morning before you came to work, or you were going to spend time getting to know your other colleagues, or you were going to smile at that particular staff who you're afraid of, like things that you were you were going to do that maybe didn't happen. So you have a way to reflect on that, or maybe they happened really great, but it, it had an unintended consequence or impact on you. So talk about that. That's why I think having things written down in a self-care plan can be really helpful. Okay. Finally, not finally. Oh my gosh, looking at time. Okay, I'm doing okay. So as a supervisor, you have to always be thinking about the next opportunity for young adult therapeutic peer mentors. They will not be young adults forever. You really have to be thinking about their development. What skills are they learning that are going to help them towards their next career step? Think about that. That's going to increase your capacity. If you're attuned to that and asking about that, that's going to, by default, inherently increase that, or sorry, strengthen that working alliance. Um, Really, I think, and I did this always, and I think this is one thing I, at the beginning of supervision, realized really early on. I needed to be asking um, young adult therapeutic peer mentors about their own vocational development, about you know courses they were taking and how they were doing in those courses, um, and also if they had another job, which was really beneficial as well, like how that was going, and just thinking about what is the career. And of course, it's going to change for these young adult therapeutic peer mentors. So that's why you got to keep bringing it up and talking about it continual dialogue about development around career so so key as part of supervision okay this part um, I think is really really important and I call it beyond empathy understanding the difference between you and me because there's this inherent um, that happens we, we make this assumption that because a young adult therapeutic member our peers that they inherently are just going to understand what a client is going through and inherently that the client is going to feel understood. And there is a lot of literature out there that suggests here's one thing from a study that I was part of, you know, a young person saying, you know, she, my peer mentor really understands where I'm coming from and I really understand where she is coming from. Um, and that that really does matter, but there's some limitations with that and this, this relationship and this understanding piece is really tricky. And so, I've pretty much mentioned many of these that the, the key the key things that a young adult therapeutic peer mentor is doing is they're they're sharing their overcoming of adversity, they're showing genuine understanding, they're focused on this working alliance, it's this really truly partnering, and they're role model modeling and they're inspiring. Um, but this, this these these are tricky things to do through only telling your story. Um, and I think we have this this um, predisposition to, to rely on, oh, hey, it's all about their, their storytelling, like they've got to share their story, but it's really not. It's about helping young adult therapeutic peer mentors to ask thoughtful questions, to be curious, to, to use motivational interviewing, um, to really get their clients to open up. Many of the things that you're in our right, it can't just be about sharing stories. It has to be mutually beneficial. And so there's this thing, and I've thought a lot about this over the last few years, that, you know, if a young person is a therapeutic peer mentor and they really only value their own experience, and this happened with a few therapeutic peer mentors I worked with, who had, they were very concrete and really couldn't get out of, well, that's my experience, so it must be this person's experience. And I did a lot of coaching and open-ended questions around, well, what do you think their experience is like? And, and what might it, how might it be different than yours? And why might that be? And how might they see this, um, you know, situation versus why do you see it this way? And really helping a, a young adult therapeutic peer mentor to see maybe why they think they, why, the way they think. This is a tenant in social work practitioner school. You're always gaining awareness of why you think the way you think. You need to be really aware of that, that that matters in your practice. There's something really interesting about this peer role where, we really want you to have a perspective. We, we want that to matter. We want it to be shared, a shared perhaps perspective on, on the world. But in fact, it can be limiting if it's your only perspective. So you want to help young adult therapeutic peer mentors to be curious and open and, and um, flexible and non-judgmental, right? All these things that, you know, might not fit with the way we just talk about peers like agreeing on things together. Maybe there could be disagreements and those are really exciting. Um, and maybe that's where the real work is. But that there, I need to just say that young people have to shift their focus. This is the way I've like been able to, to think about this. Shifting the focus away from themselves and their story and their lived experience to balancing 
really, you know, w listening, expressing emotions. Like, you got to expect this therapeutic peer mentor to, like, you know, express the emotions that are going to elicit more talking from the client, more expression from the client. And also that the therapeutic peer mentor is making some suggestions, you know. It, if it's going to be mutual, it can't just be all open-ended. That there's 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 room there for some. Hey, what about this? Have you thought about trying this? Like, why not? Um, and so, really, in your role as a as a supervisor, is to help these young adult therapeutic peer mentors to find their voice, their identity, to share their story. And this is a process, right? As you're getting to know these young people and helping them learn how to how to share their lived experience and balance it with curiosity and getting to know their clients and understand their clients. Um, I really want you to reflect on your own training through this process, right? And how you learned about what were your own biases, how you approach situations, what is your perspective in a certain situation. It's really, really important and that you're willing to process that with your young adult therapeutic preventers and supervision that you say, oh my gosh, you know, let me tell you about some of the times I like had a bias or I, there's always bias in all of our work. That we really need to be aware of them. Not that bias is bad. It's part of it's part of all relationships and all interactions. We're all coming from a particular perspective within a particular um, situation. I, I think it's impossible not to. I don't know. There's probably some theorists out there who would argue with me. Um, but this is something. Being really clear about a way to think about this is we just don't make any assumptions, right? Start, try to instill in your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. I know you have lived experience. I love your lived experience. It's so powerful and it's so awesome. But in order to really be genuinely empathetic, we cannot make assumptions about where clients are coming from. And I also, as a supervisor, can't make assumptions about where you're coming from. I can't assume that everything's always about your lived experience. It might not be. And it's unfair of me to do so. Um, and I think I've, I've pretty much hit this point home. We really don't want young people coming to this role and being really narrow in how they see their clients and thinking, oh, they must be just like me because we grew up in the same neighborhood or we went to the same therapist or we have the same diagnosis. But that's, that's not fair. And that's not what's going to be beneficial to developing a working alliance. Um, I think that one thing I get asked a lot um, whenever I'm presenting on this stuff or doing trainings is matching and like how you match um, you know, effective peer mentors with clients and that there, there should be this protocol and algorithm for that maybe. It's really because of about experience. But I would argue sometimes it's about the differences and if a client and a peer mentor can learn from each other, that that's the most exciting piece where folks are sharing what they've been through and they're learning about a different perspective and a different experience and that can be really exciting. So I don't want you to always think about the likeness that matters for matching, but it could also matter like how, what you think as a supervisor, how these two people, this client and a therapeutic peer mentor could learn from one another, right? That that's also important in matching. Um, this is just, uh, you know what, I'm gonna skip the slide and, and because of time. Um, and quickly, as I had, had said earlier about outreach and that with, with oh, sorry, let me back up. So with accommodations, Moving to accommodations quickly, accommodations are so important. They can be so much simpler than we realize. They're not this big scary thing that someone needs this mega accommodation. But there should be something that we always are aware of. All agencies should be trained. All of our therapeutic peer mentors, as well as you as a supervisor, should know how to request an accommodation for yourself and on behalf of your staff. And you should know how to respond to a request or how to perhaps prompt a request because guess what? Not all your staff are going to be like, hey, I need help. I'm struggling, and I think that if I had it different this way, it would be better, right? This is a discourse, a dialogue that you have when something's, there's a struggle on the job identified or a potential struggle, and we figure out how um, to address that. Um, and also, let me just move on because I'm going to be short on time. One thing to, to remember about accommodations, the main, main, main thing is that they need to be reasonable. And reasonable, of course, varies. It's dependent on the context and situation. There's the definition on the slide about what is truly a reasonable account accommodation. But that's something that you're going to have to determine. And it's determined between you, usually a third party, like a talent management HR type of person, your supervisor, and then your young adult therapeutic peer mentor. They also have to not have undue burden on the agency, on you as a supervisor. And that's also something that's determined within the setting. Okay. 
So accommodations, to just reiterate, definitely a, a process. One size does not fit all. One accommodation it will not be a work, work very effective with another from one staff to the other. Um, and that this is something that really needs to be written down. It is a discussion. Here I have some, I think, helpful questions to guide that discussion around accommodations. They have to be time specific. Um, and they also, you know, thinking through, will this work, will it not work in, in measuring? You have to figure out what does that work mean? How do I know the accommodation will have been successful? And really defining that. And here's a list of some accommodations that I've used, and I've also talked to people um, who've used them with young adult therapeutic preventers across the country. I think you'll notice um, these are not big game-changing things, like some extra training, an extra check-in, maybe a, a slight change in work hours to accommodate uh, therapy appointments or some other type of responsibility. Um, perhaps a reduction of uh, paperwork requirements. I know one thing that we're always concerned about is paperwork and the capacity of these young people in this new role to be able to get paperwork done in a timely fashion and have the right content in there. Well, maybe there's some accommodation around that that you to you figure out within your context. Um, just thinking about all the different types, whatever it's going to take to help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors be successful, start the conversation there, right? As long as you have a third party talking it through with you, sky's the limit, I think. Okay, with my few minutes left, I really want to bring up what I call resiliency stories and strategic sharing. Um, this, the idea of strategic sharing is that you're telling your story for a purpose at a specific time for a specific response. Um, and that I think it's a helpful frame in which to approach storytelling in general. Um, storytelling is, a, is an art and it comes with risks. And I think we all know that implicitly, but to actually just be really transparent about that and aware of it is, is really important. And my, my principles and my, the most exciting piece to all of this, when I first signed up to become um, when I was developing the program um, for peer mentors and I was the clinical supervisor, the most exciting part for me was the telling of the stories. I was so excited about, narr I just love narrative therapy and I was just thinking so much about like how storytelling is just such an important tool for cultures across the world and I just, I was so excited about it. And I think what was most beneficial for me to, to learn over time is of course the stories are always changing and just to be aware of that and to help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to be aware that their story is always changing. And so are their client stories that, you know, and especially with young adults, they're shifting what they want to do in their identity a lot. And that's normal. And so stories are going to change. Also, what might be really hard to share today might be really easy to share. Vision practice to figure out why that's, that's fun to do and, and to figure out where it feels safe to mention some things and unsafe to mention others. Um, and not to be afraid as a, a clinical supervisor to, to use your skills in storytelling and to practice storytelling and to practice sharing your stories in order to elicit um, a response from your colleagues and young adult therapeutic peer mentors. And also that there are unintended consequences. I think this is a thing we all fear as clinical supervisors when a young person shares their story and it goes awry, that the wrong response um, becomes of the storytelling. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why strategic sharing that comes out of the child welfare world, I think is a helpful tool for young people who are sharing their story to claim the meaning of their story, to be upfront about, this is what it means to me, I'm going to share it to you, but you need to know this is what my meaning it is, is of this, and you're not allowed to put your meaning on it. I will always have my own meaning of what this story is. I and mean, that might seem like not important, but it's very, very, very important. And then there's this piece of supervision is you've got to keep reflecting on storytelling. It's reflection. So here's two free resources for strategic sharing. They're both super, super helpful. I'm going to quickly just give you an overview of what strategic sharing is so that you can get an idea and a flavor for it. You definitely have a purpose of sharing a story. Um, and then you think about what it is exactly you're sharing. And this is the part that gets me most excited. You know, what are the key elements of your story that make it motivational, that make it inspirational? What might you not share that you maybe want to keep private for a variety of reasons? Is it going to be traumatic? And what does it do for your image? Like, is, does it reflect your identity or how does it reflect the agency? There's all this interesting stuff to think about in storytelling and what it means. And so these are the types of things you talk about in supervision. One also big part, 
be, of course, wondering is who's the audience? Is it the clients? Is it their family? Is it their colleagues? How do young adult therapeutic peer mentors share their story with their colleagues, right? That's super fun to process and supervision. And what do we expect to get out of this? How will the audience feel when you tell them the story? Usually storytelling is meant to evoke an emotion. What is your intention, right? And just being really true about this and talking about emotions so important. And here's the part that I think is the most important. This is for coming, of course, from child welfare, um, where young people's voice um, is not always heard. And when it is heard, it might be taken advantage of um, or co-opted. This, this point of saying, no, this is my story, and this is my the meaning I'm taking of it, and helping young know, adult therapeutic mentors to understand that and to preface their storytelling with, you know, I often can get sad when I tell this story, so here I'm going to tell it. And if a young person gets sad while telling it, they do. They get sad, and you're not expecting the client to maybe take care of them or respond in a different way. Um, I think there's a lot about being upfront and, and sharing, like, this, this is how this makes me feel when I tell this story. And those resources I gave should be very, very helpful. My own experience of this is you have to practice, practice, practice. I want to be aware of time is why I'm going a little bit quickly through this. You can use story prompting. I would say once a month to have a story workshop with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors and simply throw out one of these questions or these prompts. Describe a situation that prompted you to change your lifestyle. When did you, how did you resolve a conflict? I mean, this kind of stuff will give young adult therapeutic peer mentors ideas. That's a great way to practice storytelling isn't just with your supervisor, it's with your peers. Encourage, encourage, encourage young adult therapeutic peer mentors to practice sharing, telling their stories. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, as I'm, I will quickly mention, it's not just about sharing a story. If it was, it just wouldn't be called mentoring. The idea is, is that you are present, you are showing genuine empathy, and you are engaging in a mutual communicative process. You are talking through things, and you have to lean in, ask follow-up questions, be curious, and use motivational interviewing. And I, I'm sure a lot of you on the line are very familiar with motivational interviewing. If you're not, there's a lot of resources out there for free. These are just some types of prompts that you could potentially train and continue to coach your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to use in their work. I mentioned this before, and as kind of a final thought, is that you just really need to be thoughtful about your use of young adult um, quotes, photos, um, anything that you're asking your therapeutic peer mentors to share online through their agency, have a time limit on it. I think I'll talk more about this in the spring when I come to visit. Um, this, this is just really, really important. And finally, as my, my final slide, it is really important to think about, I mentioned this last webinar, to have a steering committee that is meeting regularly and reflecting as a agency collaboration, hopefully multidisciplinary groups and folks from some different areas of the agency, to think about how is this working and how are we truly integrating young adult therapeutic peer mentors in a way that's beneficial for them, beneficial for clients, helpful to you as a supervisor, what are we doing? There's a lot of different ways you can do that and on this page I have different ways that you could think about measuring success of your program. Of course, in order to get funding, it helps extra funding. Uh, by funding, it helps to demonstrate how your program's working. Here's some ideas. I'd love to talk about that offline more if you're interested. And finally, this is such a cool job. Um, you guys have just a real opportunity to be part of a movement in the peer world where young adults are being integrated. And they should have been integrated a long, long time ago. But it's so cool because you're part of a young person's development. You're part of a movement that is changing the face of uh, mental health services as we know it, and I think it's really exciting. You also are going to inevitably change your culture at your agency. You already probably are doing so by um, being a supervisor of young adult therapeutic mentors. So with that, thank you all so much.